Welcome back to Learn Electrics. In this video, we will look at the schedule of test results and how to complete it correctly. Shown here is the model form of the schedule of test results as issued by the IET. All other forms, whether from NAPIT, NIC, EIC, your local wholesaler, etc., are all based on this model form. Learn what we have here and you will be able to complete anybody else's forms. Before we begin, you must understand that the schedule of test results is not a standalone certificate. It is part of the pack of papers that accompany an electrical installation certificate or an electrical installation condition report. Technically, it is not valid just on its own. You will find examples of model forms in the IET books shown here, which are BS 7671 wiring regulations, the on-site guide and guidance note 3 on inspection and testing. The most useful book for me is the electrician's guide to the building regulations for reasons that we will come to shortly. In this video, all references to any of the books will be to the 18th edition versions. Let's begin. I break the schedule of test results into six distinct blocks that I complete in turn. Starting at the top left, we enter details of the incoming supply at the main switch to this consumer unit, the consumer unit to which this schedule relates. In the centre, we enter details of any circuits that might be susceptible to damage during testing. Top right, we must enter details of the test meter or meters that we used to test the circuits on this schedule. Back to the left hand side now and a section for the name and signature of the person testing the circuits and the date that the tests were carried out. Bottom left, we find a big section called Circuit Details with enough entry rows for a standard 12-way consumer unit. More than 12 ways will require a continuation sheet. And finally, on the right, another big section simply called Test Results. Let's begin and we will complete this schedule with examples as we move along. Top left we must enter details of the incoming supply at the main switch for this board. What is happening at this main switch? That is the question. So, DB reference. Does this distribution board or consumer unit have a name or a reference number? In a factory, it may well be listed as DB4 or canteen or some other way of identifying it. In a house, it may well be the only board, so calling it house will be fine. Next, where is it located? Under the stairs, in the kitchen, the hallway, wherever. Now we come to an entry that confuses a lot of people. It says ZS at DB. But, everyone shouts, we always put ZE in there. So, a little explanation. Here we have a consumer unit with an incoming supply and we can measure ZD at the main switch of this consumer unit. Several circuits leave the consumer unit and go to the sockets, the lights, etc. At each of these sockets, the lights, the cooker, the shower and so on, we will measure ZS. We will have lots of ZSs but only one ZE in the property. So far, so good. Now, let us add a second consumer unit in the garage. The customer wants power and lights in their garage. The feed to this new consumer unit, CU2, will have a ZS value since it is fed by the house consumer unit. It is treated in just the same way as the sockets and lights. Now, 
we can install the socket to CU2. The socket that comes off CU2 will have a ZS as well. And so will the lights in the garage. There will be lots of ZSs in the garage, but only one ZE, and that is at the main switch to CU2. But hold on, look at the yellow arrow. We called this a ZS a moment ago, and now we want to call it ZE. Is it a ZS or is it a ZE? And we can only have one ZE, and that is already allocated to the consumer unit in the house. But it can't be a ZS either. So, to get around this, we call the Z measurement at the main switch ZDB. The Z measurement at the distribution board. This way, we do not run into the conundrum of having two ZE readings in one building. ZDB is the Z measurement at the main switch for whichever consumer unit you are testing. Now we can return to the schedule and enter the Z value as 0 0.09 ohms in this example. Our meter may give us the prospective fault current at the main switch. It is called IPF on the schedule and this stands for current prospective fault, which is another way of saying prospective fault current. Next, did you check the incoming supply polarity? that phase, neutral and earth are all the correct way round. Tick this box if it was correct. We are dealing here with single phase, so three phase sequencing is not applicable. Just enter NA. Moving along the top, we have vulnerable equipment. Any installed equipment that may be affected by the tests, especially the 500 volt insulation resistance test, will be listed here. On this schedule, we have listed some common items that will need to be removed from circuit before testing or linked out. And the examples might include USB charging points built into the sockets, fluorescent lights in kitchens that have a step-up transformer inside, motion detecting lights or PIRs on the driveway as the PIR units may be damaged. And last on the top row is the type and serial numbers of the test meters used. Some electricians prefer to use separate test meters for low ohms testing, loop testing, insulation resistance, RCD tests, etc. In which case they must each be listed and they must be calibrated. If you use a combined tester, a multifunction tester, you need only enter the information once. On the left of the schedule again, we must enter the details of who tested the circuits and the date of the testing. If this data is not entered, then the schedule of test results is not valid. Someone has to take responsibility. And now to the two big boxes. The circuit details section can be completed by visual inspection and knowledge of what is in the consumer unit without the need for any testing. Personally, I always complete all of this section before moving on to the testing section. This is where the electrician's guide to the building regulations comes in very useful. If you have a copy of the electrician's guide, turn to page 104. There you will find a list. Look at the schedule of test results and each column in this section has a small number at the top. The information in the list on page 104 relates directly to each of these column numbers and I have circled them in red on this slide. So let us complete this circuit details section as I would complete it. Circuit number. Write the numbers of each circuit down the first column, followed by what is in that numbered location in column 2. You will see here that I have included the RCD in the list, 
and I will explain that in just a minute. In column 3, we enter the BS number of the fuse or breaker. There's not much space, but we can squeeze it in. Now, in column 4, what is the type letter? Most domestic breakers are type B, and this information will be on the front of the breaker. Column 5 is the nominal rating, so a B32 circuit breaker is type B with a 32 amp rating. Column 6 is for the braking capacity. If there was a massive fault at the consumer unit, thousands of amps, what is the maximum current that this breaker will definitely be able to disconnect or switch off safely? This would normally be shown on the device front or side as 6,000. This is 6,000 amps. Column 6 says kiloamps, so just write in 6. Some devices, especially 3-phase, will say 10,000 amps or 10 kiloamps. Column 7 asks for the trip rating of the RCD. Most often this will be 30 milliamps. The RCD will show this as 30 milliamps or as 0 0.03 amps. In column 8, we are asked to enter the maximum permitted ZS for each breaker. I always use the maximum measured value as shown in the on-site guide. This is used as a comparison later when we actually do test ZS. Column 9 wants us to enter a reference method for that circuit. Reference method B, C, 101, etc. At Learn Electrics, we have produced a video on installation reference methods. It is called Learn Electrical Reference Methods. Column 10 requires us to enter the size or cross sectional area of the phase and neutral conductors. And column 11 wants the size of the CPC or circuit protective conductor. The earth as we call it. We are talking about twin and earth. Let us look at circuit numbering now. There is no absolute must-do numbering method, but let's look at one system that many electricians adopt and discuss the problems with it and then look at how I suggest it is done. Here we have a consumer unit with two RCDs and two circuits on each RCD. So in total there are only four breakers. So number them one, two, three, four. Easy. Six months later, additional circuits are added, circuits five and six. Follow the yellow arrows on this slide. And a while later, circuit seven is added, followed by circuit eight. Can you see the problem we have built up for ourselves and any other electrician who visits in the future? The numbers do not run in sequence, and if we renumber the circuits, they won't match up to the schedule of test results when the installation was first put in. I think you will agree that it can get messy, and messy can be dangerous for whoever is working on the board. The method I use, and the way we teach it at Learn Electrics, is to number all the ways in strict numerical order. The first way after the main switch is number 1, and a 12-way board will be labelled 1 to 12. Now, complete your schedule of test results and write in exactly what is in every way. RCD in ways 1 and 2, then breakers in 3 and 4, include the spare ways in 5 and 6, and so on. Way 11 was a spare, but we have now added a new circuit in that position. But because we have chosen this better method of numbering, it makes no difference to the logic or order of the other circuits. Life just goes on, and hopefully this method makes sense. Enough of numbering systems, back to filling in the schedule. The test results box on the schedule can now be completed. Page 104 
of the electrician's guide will help you with explanations for each column as before. Columns 12, 13 and 14 are for use with ring circuits, the end-to-end -end resistance of the phase, neutral and CPC. Column 15 requires the R1 plus R2 readings for each circuit. Column 16 is for when you have tested the CPC only, such as with upgrading bonding when you will use the Wanderlead method. A value can be entered or a tick if the reading is acceptable, whichever you prefer. Now, entering column 17, the test voltage used for the insulation resistance test for that particular circuit. 18 and 19 are for the insulation resistance test results. Always enter the lowest value, the worst case. You will have two live to earth results, i.e. phase to earth and neutral to earth. And again, use the lowest of these. Column 20 would just require a tick if the circuit polarity is correct. In column 21, we enter the actual ZS value either by measurement or by calculation. For column 22, enter the actual disconnection time of the RCD for the five times test. And in 23, place a tick if the RCD operated when the test button was pressed. For column 24, if an AFDD or arc fault detection device is installed, Press the test button and put a tick in the box if it operates. And finally, in column 25, we can add any remarks about any of the circuits that will help us when we revisit the installation. This is, if you like, your scribble pad. A very quick recap. The schedule of test results is not a standalone document. It is part of the pack that is put together with an electrical installation certificate or an electrical installation condition report after a periodic inspection. Look at the schedule as having six separate sections to complete. Completing them one at a time breaks the task down into much easier steps. Good working practice says pay attention to the numbering system. Think about what happens to the numbers if the installation has extra circuits added in the future. And do use page 104 of the Electrician's Guide to the Building Regulations. It will help putting information into each column. Finally, completing these schedules and certificates is a learning process. It takes time and repetition to become proficient. Practice whenever you can. Test a circuit at home and complete the paperwork for it. Anything that makes you better when you are on site on a customer's premises is useful. And good luck. We hope that you've enjoyed this video from Learn Electrics. If you click subscribe below, you will not miss our next weekly Tech Tips video. And clicking subscribe does help us too. And we do appreciate that small action. You can also type in Learn Electrics, or one word, into the YouTube search bar, and that will give you access to all of our videos. And we can also be found at learnelectrics.com. Thank you for watching, and we hope to see you again very soon.